welcome to everyone in the various churches. And so we just want to take some time this morning just to thank the Lord and ask uh, Pastor uh, Roberts to lead us in prayer. Ask God's blessing on the food that we ate, on the fellowship that we're going to have, and in particular the teaching for this morning from uh, Pastor Mark. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you. What a joy to be together, O oh Lord God, this morning. Lord, we thank you for gathering your saints and your servants, O oh Lord God, together. O oh God, this morning is a special, O oh Lord God, a day for us, O oh Lord God. After the heavy weekend of hard working, O oh Lord God, ministering to the people, and it's a refreshing time for us, O oh Lord God, to sit back and listen what you are telling to us, O oh Lord God, how to continue the work in this country, O oh Lord God. Lord, we thank you. You called us from different walk of life, di from different nations, different languages, O oh Lord. But for one purpose, O oh Lord God, for thy kingdom to move, O oh Lord God. Lord, we thank you once again this morning. Thank you for this facility and the privilege of coming together. Thank you for your servant that you have brought in, O oh Lord God, Martha, to speak into our life, O oh Lord God. So we are open, O oh Lord God, what the Spirit of the Lord wants to say to us, O oh Lord God. We thank you for once again the breakfast and the fellowship and the continuation of your work that's going to take place in this country. We give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. I don't want to spend any much more time. We are blessed to have uh, Pastor Mark Morrow. Tremendous story of uh, how he started the current church where he is in. And we are blessed to always have someone who is speaking from their heart, from experience. Him and his wife, they have raised 10 children. That is one husband, one wife, 10 children. <laughs> Qualify that here in Kuwait, okay? And uh, they are, their ministry is uh, uh, involved with many different languages as well, and people, groups. And the patriarch is here, you've met him already. And so we're blessed to, to hear this morning from Mark. But before he does, I'm going to ask Pastor Sushil, who is the general overseer from the Church of God for the Kuwait area. He himself was here for a number of years here in, in Kuwait, just to come and give a, a personal testimony about the ministry of Mark Morrow and, and why he even brought him here and what's the reason behind. And we at Lighthouse were blessed. We had the Pastor Mark speak and Pastor Don. It was great. We really enjoyed the, the, the word of God that you had for us. So we're looking forward to hearing from what Lord put on your heart for us as ministers here in Kuwait. Thank you, Pastor. I received the prophetic word of elevating me from a national overseer to a general overseer, which is from one country to 185 countries. <laughs> well... <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm actually the overseer for Kuwait, for the Churches of God. We have about 15 churches here, and we're blessed. Thank God for the ministry and the opportunities to serve God in Kuwait. I used to live here for three years, but for the past couple of years, I've moved back to the U.S. where my family resides, mainly because my ministerial responsibilities increased to include the Middle East and North Africa. It's about 22 countries. So it was difficult to hold a full-time job, stay in Kuwait, have an akama, and then be traveling all the time. So I had to go back home. And I want to thank God for the wonderful privilege. Before I introduce Pastor Mark and talk a little bit about him, I want to first of all say, don't we love Lighthouse people and the pastors and the team, don't we? Pastor Gerald, Pat, uh, Shaji, Gideons, everybody, so much. We thank you so much and appreciate your leadership in bringing and pulling the churches together. This is probably the second or the third time we're being able to do this, at least with my involvement. So I want to personally thank you so much for being like um, a parent organization, so to speak, and um, being able to pull churches together for the kingdom of God. And glory be to God for that. And thank you once again for doing that. I happened to meet uh, Pastor Mark at an international conference in uh, Saddleback Church, Rick Warren's church, where they had a conference called the Finishing the Task. The emphasis of world missiologists these days is to identify people groups that have yet to hear the gospel around the world. So the emphasis is shifting from a traditional missions uh, model of sending missionaries and living there for their lifetime and doing it, rather to empower and train and disciple indigenous local people from different people groups so that people groups can hear the gospel. Matthew 24, 14 says, 
and the kingdom of and the gospel of this kingdom shall be preached to all the nations but in the original language it is people groups ethnics ethno ethnic ethnicity so the emphasis is to do that so in that particular conference pastor mark was one of the featured speakers there and i understood about his passion to reach the nations he's traveled to more than 50 countries of the world sharing the gospel places difficult places like pakistan uh, some of the other countries and god has blessed him to have mega crusades and uh, evangelistic meetings but particularly what caught my attention was that his church found out a people in himachal pradesh in india and the hill tribes that did not have a bible in their own language so they were passionate about it so they invested money and have the bible translated into the dogri language so people from the himachal pradesh the tribal people from that place now have a bible in their own language we take it for granted because we have so many languages so many bibles let all be glory be to god and pastor mark and his church have invested thousands of dollars to translate the bible into the dogri language so i just thank god for his church his passion and his work and uh, we're so glad to have him and his missions pastor his father is his missions pastor he is the lead pastor and his son is the youth pastor so they have three generations serving together i wonder what a board meeting looks like or or a pastoral meeting dad will say shh shh no he's a tough guy he is the boss he is the leader so let's just put our hands together and invite pastor mark pastor mark Thank you Susho. What a joy it is to get to be with you today. It's my first time to Kuwait and uh what a beautiful country. What a beautiful what a special place this is. And uh, and I hope I hope Pastor Susho it's not my last time. I've really made some good friends here and uh and, and I I just I have a heart for what you're doing. And I got a chance to speak in some churches yesterday and and uh just you know my heart's linked and it it's just a joy a joy to be here to serve you and uh and and to be together um uh, you know pastor golbeck was up here talking kindly about me and about pastor sushil but did you know they are our host this week they opened their own home most places i go the pastors put you in a hotel <laughs> or worse <laughs> a hostel <laughs> but pastor pastor gerald and pat allowed us to move into their own house into their own private space and they stocked their refrigerator with delicious juices and 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 had you know things there for us to snack on and and uh that is a special special leader that can do that what a joy it is to have my dad here with us and and uh, to be able to have a traveling companion and and uh and my heart for missions came from him and and then you you heard them talking about my family yes we do have 10 children would you like to meet them there's my family right there okay so i have 10 children uh all born biologically all one at a time all from the same wife i have four children that married into our family and so now we have 14 children and uh, and they all live around us they all serve in the same church five of my children are on our pastoral staff and then i have seven grandchildren so far but they're coming very very fast <laughs> they're like they're multiplying like rabbits <laughs> i need an excel spreadsheet just to keep <laughs> keep keep a list of their birthdays <laughs> So that's my family. Well, did you bring It's interesting, you know, before I say this. Psalm 127 tells us that children are a blessing of the Lord. And Proverbs tells us that curse that that debt is a curse. A curse of the devil. And we have a tendency to be wired oppositely to the way God is wired because of our carnal nature. Our carnal nature wires us one way. God's holy nature wires him an opposite way. 
And God calls children a blessing and debt a curse. But isn't it interesting how people all over the world do everything they can to prevent more children and do everything they can to qualify for more debt. <laughs> it's just really interesting. But anyway, God has certainly blessed us and opened doors for us with the, with the family that we have. Well, I'd like to speak to you about a topic this morning that I've never spoken on before in 35 years of traveling to over 50 countries, speaking to leaders. As I sought the Lord for this meeting here, just so you know, all the services that we preached yesterday was the extra gravy. The reason I'm here in Kuwait is for this meeting this morning to speak to you, to speak to you about a topic that I've never preached on before. As I sought the Lord and fasted and prayed for the message for Kuwait, the Lord gave me this word for this moment in this meeting. And so I hope that you take your pens and, 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 the, and, the, and the notes, the note paper that they so graciously provided, and I hope you're ready to hear not just a sermon, but a word from the Lord for us for now. Are you ready for that? The power, the power of ecclesiastical unity. If you have your copy of God's Word, would you turn with me in our textbook, our leadership manual, the best leadership manual ever written, John chapter 17. John chapter 17. John chapter 17. So I'm going to begin reading in verse 4, and then we'll skip down to verse 20. I, Jesus is talking here. I brought glory to you. He's actually speaking to the Heavenly Father. I, Jesus, brought to you, Heavenly Father, here on earth. I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work that you gave me to do. So the father gave an assignment. Jesus understood that assignment. He carried it out in complete unity with the father. They weren't divided. Skipping down to verse 20. I am praying. He still, Jesus is still speaking to the father. I am praying not only for these disciples... They were gathered in the upper room on the last night before he was crucified the next day. I'm praying not only for these immediate disciples, followers in the room here, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will be one. Just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me, may they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Can we just pray together? Lord Jesus, I pray that over the next couple of hours of us being together, 
that your principles, your truth would just be galvanized in our spirit. And I pray for a spirit of courage to emerge from each one of these amazing leaders to go and carry out your principles in their realm of influence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So let's just go back down through this passage, one by, phrase by phrase, and let's just analyze what Jesus was doing here. Let's unpack it. Jesus began by saying, I am praying. Yeah. What we see here is this passage in John 17 is a portion of the longest recorded prayer in the Bible. And it's by Jesus to his heavenly father. A very intimate moment the night before the next day when he was facing a horrific crucifixion. It's his last night on earth. You can imagine the emotion that's flooding. It's the most important things on his mind. I'm praying. One of his disciples, the disciple closest to him, John, was near him and heard him praying and overheard this intimate conversation between father and son. And he wrote it down and it got immortalized in, because it got recorded in one of the gospels. And now we have this prayer 2,000 years later for us as leaders to analyze, break down, and apply to our lives. He's praying. He's praying. Not only for the immediate disciples in the room, but also for all who will believe in me. How many of you here believe the same message that Peter, James, and John preached originally? How many believe that, the message? Jesus died on the cross, rose again, saves us from our sin. Four of us, and we're, we're pastors? Let me see. How many of you believe? Really? So, so Jesus was praying for you. Think about that. Jesus was praying for you. And we're going to see exactly what he was praying for you about. But I hope I've got your attention. Jesus, the creator of the universe, was praying for me for this moment right now. Is that sinking in? Do, do we have our attention? <laughs> What would those early disciples be facing? We know because we've read the Pauline epistles and the general epistles. What would Christians all down through the ages be facing? We've seen lots of martyrdom, many countries, many generations. What do we face today in our own ministries? We face persecution for our faith. We face physical ailments. Some, some people face marital stress in the ministry. Oh, yes, that's a very real thing. Many, most of us here, all of us here face temptation to sin. Right? We don't want to admit that. There are many, many challenges that you and I face every single day. There are many, many things that Jesus could have prayed for. Jesus, I pray that you, now God, Father, I pray that you'd strengthen them in temptation. I pray that you would heal them in health. I pray that you would preserve their marriages. Jesus could have prayed for a lot of things and he would have been accurate. <laughs> but Jesus didn't pray for those things. 
As important as they are, Jesus did not pray for you for those things. What did he pray for? He prayed for something else. And the reason why he didn't pray for those other things as important as they are is because there was one thing that was standing out, paramount in Jesus' mind. His greatest concern, more than conquering temptation, more than being physically healed, more than having a sound marriage and spiritual leadership, there was one thing that trumped them all. Why? Because what he prayed for would ultimately affect, would ultimately determine our effectiveness in the Great Commission. If we get it right, we succeed in the Great Commission. If we don't get it right, we fail in the Great Commission. You can accomplish the Great Commission and still struggle with sin. People do it all the time. You can accomplish the Great Commission and not have a perfect marriage. You can accomplish the Great Commission and be very, very sick. But you cannot accomplish the Great Commission if you fail in the area that Jesus prayed for us. And that's why it was his gravest concern on the most important night of his life. What was his prayer? I pray that they would all be one. Jesus prayed for our unity as believers. That was the paramount concern on his mind. So I think it's important then if Jesus, if that was so important to Jesus, we need to break this down and define it and find out exactly what Jesus meant. Because it could be that he meant something that we've misinterpreted. What does it mean to be one? My father is the math expert, I'm not. But they tell me that one is an integer. One is a number that is indivisible. You cannot divide it. It is a whole number that cannot be divided. Two, you can divide in half and have two ones. Four, you can divide half and have two twos. But one, you cannot divide one. Indivisible. One is one. You just can't have it. And so Jesus here says, Father, you and I are one. We are indivisible. Jesus and the Father could not be divided. That's where we get the word tri-unity, trinity, the trinity, tri-unity. Three separate entities in one, trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit functioning so well in unity that they are one. When I pray, I'm not praying to the Father, the Son, or the, or, or the Holy Ghost. I'm praying to God. God, would you just do this? <laughs> Y'all figure it out up there who's going to do it. But God, I need you right now. God. One. One God. So verse 4. Let's go back to verse 4. Jesus is praying, Father, I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work that you gave me to do. 
So Jesus and the Father were one in purpose. You, you've got to get this. They were not one in personality. They were not one in, in, uh, in, in role. They were one in purpose. You may want to write that down. They were not one in personality or role. They were one in purpose. <clears throat> the father and the son were absolutely unified, but they were not the same. We have to get this because this is the greatest misunderstanding in the human, in, in, in human uh, spiritual leadership. They were one in purpose, but they were not one in the same. Sameness is not unity. Common purpose is unity. The father had a certain role. The son had a certain role. The Holy Spirit had a certain role. They all three were very, very different from each other, but they all still were completely one. I like to say the father thought it, the son bought it, and the spirit wrought it. All three very, very different roles, but completely one in purpose. Are you getting this? And so let's look at what the definition then of unity is out of what we've seen so far. Unity. While everyone is maintaining their own distinctiveness, they are all still going in the same direction in order to accomplish the same purpose. Let's look at the Trinity for a minute. While the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit maintains their distinctiveness, they're all very three different from each other, different dispensations, different roles, but they're all still going in the same direction in order to accomplish the same purpose. Jesus said, Father, I've come and I've given you glory because I've accomplished your purpose. We are the same. We are the, not the same. We are on the same page. We have, we have been unified be, by our purpose, even though, Father, you're very different from me. You, you, you got to get this. We have to understand the Trinity first before we can ever figure out how to get along here in this room. Let me illustrate this unity. <clears throat> I have here a, a diagram of the Kuwaiti soccer team, a uh, football team, the Kuwaiti football team, okay? There are 11 players, but they are not the same. They're extremely different from each other. This guy over here, He's really, really good with his hands, the goalie, the goalkeeper. But as good as he is with his hands, none of the other players can even use their hands at all. <laughs> so he's got a very, very different role than all the other team. These two guys up here, man, they are so skillful with their feet. They can juggle, they can juke, they can get around, and they can pop that ball into the net. These guys are good at getting that ball in the net. These four guys back here, they're not concerned about getting the ball in the net. They're concerned about breaking up the opposition as they're coming down to get the ball in, in their own net. This, and so their skill set is far different than the skill set up here. And it's a big mistake if you try to put one of these guys up here. I was, a soccer, I, was a, I was a football coach. I played football for years, and then I became a coach. And we got up on our rivals, three, three goals to zero. We were doing great. And I thought, hey, it's the second half. Let's take one of our skilled players up here 
and add him back here so we could have five defenders and only one offensive person. That was a mistake. <laughs> they, they scored on us and I said, hey, hey, you're getting put back up there. We need you back up there. But see, even though there are very, very different roles, they all are going in the same direction for the one purpose. The one purpose is to get more balls into this net than you allow into this net. And all 11, the better they function as one with the perp common purpose, the more likely they are to prevail in the tournament. But the day that they lose sight of the goal, the day that they start worrying about their own uh, contracts, the day that they start worrying about their own popularity and skills and how many autographs I'm gonna sign after the game, the, way they, the day they start functioning, focusing on themselves and, 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 and disputing with, you know, not liking the other guy on this team over here, that's the day they start to break down. That's the day they lose. I want to tell you something. It is okay for other people to be different. Would you just take a moment, look at the person across the table from you and say these words, I give you permission to be different from me. <laughs> it's okay. Some of you are goalies. Some of you are strikers. Some of you are midfielders. Some of you are defenders. It's okay. Because our unity is not based on our sameness. Our unity is based on our common purpose. What is the goal? What is the goal? And once we clarify the goal, then your difference and my difference can come together regardless of our differences because we got the same goal. And we're going to get there two different ways, but at the end of the day, we're going to accomplish the goal. We have different interests, different colors in this room. Some of you are blessed. My dad and I, we struggle. We are, as I told Billison's congregation yesterday, we are pigment deficient. <laughs> Some of you have different genders, different perspectives, different culture different backgrounds. Some of you have different beliefs. It's okay. It's okay. Some of you have different interpretations of certain Bible verses. It's okay. Oh, it's getting quiet in here now. <laughs> We're starting to squirm a little bit. What do you see? What do you see? I know it's a little blurry. But they're all different shapes, all different colors.
they're also all broken pieces. We're not looking for perfection here. In fact, we're going to make something beautiful out of brokenness. How many here are perfect? No, we're all broken. We're all broken. We all have different colors. We all have different shapes. Spiritually and physiologically and emotionally. Psychologically, we all have different shapes, different colors, different. But we're all broken. That's the commonality here. But you know what? If we can somehow become connected in an orchestrated way, then from Heavenly's perspective, we become something beautiful. A stained glass window. This square here is just a blow up of, of a little section right there. Unfortunately, we get all caught up here on earth in our little microcosm, in our little compound here in Kuwait City, and we, and we forget that God's looking down upon us from this perspective, from a heavenly perspective, from a distance going, oh, that is so beautiful, that is so beautiful, oh, that's beautiful. Meanwhile, we're going, well, why aren't you red? Why are you that shape? How come you're connected to that? God's up in heaven going, forget it. It doesn't matter. It's beautiful. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. Don't expect people to be just like you. Don't expect people to change, to become more like you. If somebody is expecting somebody else to change to become more like them, doesn't that just sound arrogant to you? Isn't that the problem of sin, our sinful carnal nature? Don't we struggle with pride? And the root of our pride, the root of our problem is pride. And the manifestation of pride is you need to become more like me. Which is saying, I'm better, my ways are better, my beliefs are better, my looks are better, my dress code is better, everything I do is better. You need to stop what you're doing, regardless of your cultural background, and become more like me. But unity is not changing another person to be the same as you. Unity is clarifying the purpose and then both pursuing it. Unity is not in changing another person to be the same as you. Unity is clarifying the purpose and then both pursuing it. Let's, let's apply this now to what we've already seen. Unity is not in the father telling the son, you need to be more like me. <laughs> no, unity is the father saying, son, you have a different role. Go do it. We'll accomplish the task together. And so the unity of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit was not in their sameness. The unity of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit was they were all pursuing the same goal, the same purpose. 
We have to redeem a lost world back to us. We have to reconcile a lost world back to us. That's the purpose. We're all three going to approach it different ways, but at the end of the day, that's the goal. And there's no disputing among the Trinity. No one's trying to make the other person like themselves. Let's look at a football team. The unity of a football team is not the goalie trying to teach the forwards how to handle the ball with their hands. <laughs> You'll get a penalty real fast. No, the unity of a football team is clarifying the purpose. We got to get this ball into that net and prevent this ball from getting to our net. That's our purpose. We're all 11 going to work hard at that in unison. We all are going to do it differently. You're going to use your hands. You're going to use your feet. You're going to use your hip check as a, as, a, as a defender. But at the end of the day, this is how we're going to beat our rival. And in this room, in this room, we already get, looked across the table and gave permission for people to be different. In this room, our unity is not changing the person across the table from you to be more like you. God forbid. No, our unity is clarifying our purpose and then all of us pursuing it together. Embracing our differences as broken pieces of varying colors of glass. Several years ago, my wife and I, we, uh, we bought tickets, expensive tickets, to go see an orchestra. And we showed up there just on time, and we heard in the lobby, they were already playing their instruments. And we thought, oh my goodness, we're late. And we walked in, we got our seat, and it was the most horrendous thing we've ever experienced. They were all playing their instruments at the same time. And there was no conductor. They were just playing. And, and the, the, the timpanis in the back were, were tuning and they were making noise and ding, 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 ding. And, and, and the horns were, were, were practicing a, a difficult piece in the score that, that, that they've had struggles with. And, and the flutes were tuning and, and, the, and the clarinets and, and, the, and the, 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 the cellos were, 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 were going like this and, and the violins were going like this. Everybody was playing. It was a hundred different pieces in the orchestra and they were all playing their own tune their own stuff and it was awful it was the epitome of discord i looked at my wife and i said what in the world have we paid for and she says oh mark you don't know these things they're just warming up <laughs> oh is that what this is they're just warming up. We sat there. And around time, the conductor emerged from the side. He came, stood on the red box. And it went quiet. And they all focused, they all laid down their instruments. And they focused on the one conductor. And he took that white stick called a baton and he raised it. And when he raised his baton in unison, 100 different participants raised their instruments ready to play at the same time. And when on the downbeat of the baton happened, it was the most beautiful, symphonized expression of music all 100 pieces playing from the same score sheet but conspicuously absent from this picture the flute was not telling the trumpet you need to sound more like me <laughs> 
Can you imagine what the concert would have sounded like if we'd had a hundred flutes? <laughs> the, 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 the bass over here was not telling the drums, you need to sound more like me. No, the bass was appreciating the drums difference because the bass knew that without the drums, they wouldn't have a rhythm and they wouldn't sound as good. And so their, their, their effectiveness was not in their sameness. No, they maintained their distinctiveness and their differences, but they were all aiming for the same purpose, and that was to entertain Mark and Pam Morrow because they paid tickets. <laughs> they were saying, let's perform this symphony together. Let's let our diversity make us broader. And can I just suggest to you humbly as a friend, and we just clarify here before I make any enemies. My name is Mark Morrow, and I am your friend. <laughs> May I humbly suggest that this same rule can apply to your churches. Remember a while ago when you looked across the table and you gave permission for another person to be different from you? Let's expand that principle. We should not expect other churches to act like us, look like us, sound like us, Structure like us, sing like us, or even believe like us. Furthermore, we should not set out to make other churches change to become more like our church. Doesn't that kind of sound a little bit like spiritual arrogance? Our ways are better than your ways, and you should cancel your ways and adopt our ways. Doesn't that just smell? You wrote this down a while ago. Let's adjust some words here. Unity is not in changing another church to be the same as your church. Unity is clarifying the purpose and then all the churches pursuing it. Oh, man. We may want to write that down. Because it's foundational to every single thing that we're going to talk about from here on. Unity is not changing another church to be the same as your church. Unity is clarifying the purpose and then all churches pursuing that purpose. What is that purpose? If, if, the, the purpose of a football team is to get the ball into that net. If the purpose 
of the Trinity is to get us lost people reconciled, if the purpose of an orchestra is to entertain the audience, then what is the purpose of each and every one of our churches individually, which becomes the purpose of, each of our, all of our churches corporately? There is only one church in Kuwait. Did you know that? There is only one church in Kuwait. One church. All of you are representing simply congregations of that one church. But we are one church of Kuwait. What is the purpose of the one church of Kuwait? What then distills down, trickles down to the one purpose of your individual congregation to contribute to the one purpose of the one church? What is that purpose? You ready? This is the purpose. Whoop. Oops, sorry about the formatting here. Why does a local church exist? What is the purpose? Why do you open your doors every Friday and invite people in? Why do you have an office? Why do you have a database? Why do you have people that you relate to? Three things, number one, we are a bride. <clears throat> We are the bride of Christ. We relate to Jesus. We make his day because we exist and we worship him and we respond to him. He is overflowing in abundant love. He's, he, he is infinitely and eternally in love and he's got to have an expression of that love in order for it to be fulfilled and you are that expression. You are the object of that affection and so he loves your congregation. It's his bride which is the highest form of love, the most intimate form of love. We are the bride of Christ. And when we gather, we worship and we're making Jesus' day because we're here. And let me tell you something. When I went on my honeymoon with my bride, she was concerned about her imperfections. But as her broom, I didn't care. And we'll leave it at that because anything more will start to get tacky. But we may find our imperfections, but Jesus is so madly in love with your church, he overlooks the perfections. The fact that you may not believe everything just right, or you may not have the structure just perfect, or you, know, you may not have done this particular thing right. Jesus is in heaven going, I don't care. You're my bride. And baby, you are beautiful. You see, as much as I love Pam, it helps me overlook all her imperfections. She tells me she has a lot of them. I don't know. I don't, I don't see them. We're the bride of Christ. But we're also a body a body of interconnected parts, a body of believers that come together. There's a pastor that couldn't be here this morning. She called in a little bit earlier and I preached at her church yesterday and she called in a little earlier and she said, look, I can't be there today because we are, we are doing the interconnecting. We are ministering to each other. There's a lady in the hospital that's, that's sick and dying and we have to be there. No problem. You're doing the body work, man. Hey, no problem. This is what we do. We are interconnected. And when my toe hurts, my hands reach down and try to massage it. We react to each other and we're keeping each other afloat. We're, we're, do you have Alcoholics Anonymous? Oh, you don't have Alcoholics Anonymous in Kuwait because you don't have alcohol. <laughs> but have you heard of Alcoholics Anonymous? All right, it's just, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a group of people that get together to help each other overcome the common, the common, uh, uh, the common device in the room. Well, our church is Sinners Anonymous. We get together, we're just helping each other overcome the, the elephant in the room. <laughs> okay, our struggle with our carnal nature. We are a body and we are a blessing. 
I was thrilled a while ago as I sat in the back watching how the, in the announcements and, and you were talking about Bible distribution to the community and to the lost. We are a blessing to this community. We are a blessing to this community. I pray that the people in the compound pray for the folks across the street. <laughs> That's biblical, by the way. First Timothy tells us to pray for spiritual leaders because, so that we can live in peace. So we're a blessing in this, in, in this country. This is why we open our doors on Friday mornings. This is our afternoons or evenings. This is why we exist. This is why we have a charter, why we have a name, why we congregate, why we meet in the basement, why we meet in this room. This is why we gather for these three reasons. This is our purpose individually as congregations, but corporately as a body of believers. Building on this, would you write this down? A great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission will grow a great church. A great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission will grow a great church. We're talking about our purpose. Talking about our purpose. A great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission will grow a great church. This is our purpose. This is our reason for existence. This is our mission. This is our goal. This is our objective. The founder of our organization has already given us our charter, the great commandment and the great commission. If you went out and you says, I want to I want to buy a franchise, a McDonald's franchise. He said, I want to buy a McDonald's franchise. I want to own my own McDonald's restaurant. Well, the founder of McDonald's has already said we are going to serve hamburgers and French fries and serve sodas to drink. But if you bought that McDonald's, and you said, but I don't want to serve hamburgers. I want to serve Sharma. Sharma. You're going to have a problem. <laughs> and we have a problem. We have churches gather together and they lose sight of the goal and they start their own agenda. They become a country club instead of a hospital. This is our mission. This is our common goal. If all the churches in Kuwait would embrace this instead of, instead of bickering over their individually stuff, if we could all just lay that down and say, let's focus on this. This is the ball in the net. We might get somewhere. But it's extremely difficult. What the church of Kuwait is facing is a common problem and it's a difficult and it's so difficult. It is your greatest difficulty. No one is, no one is dismissing that. It is so difficult and Jesus, in his foreknowledge, knew that it would be so difficult that this is why he spent his time praying on his last night on earth. He prayed against this difficulty. He 
continue to pray. May they be one as we are one. Just as Jesus is committed to being unified with the Father about accomplishing the same mission, even though they are very different, Jesus prayed that we in this room too would be just as committed at being unified with each other about accomplishing the same mission even though we are very different. That truth just needs to sink in. May they be one as we are one. Father, just as you and I are one about the mission, let them also be one about the mission. You see, we're all on the same team. But instead of arguing with each other about trivial matters, we have to remember that the real opposition is the devil and all of his cohorts, which would love nothing more than our church. to be silenced. Instead of arguing over our differences, we need to be focused on the goal. We have to win Kuwait to Jesus. How are we doing on that so far? You see, once, the, once we lose sight of the goal, winning Kuwait for Jesus, once we lose sight of the goal and we start having other goals like doctrinal purity or improved structure, governing structure, or whatever you want to put in there, when we get our eyes off of the goal and we create other goals other purposes, then we're going to immediately start fighting amongst ourselves. And in the grand scheme of things, God is in heaven going, that's so petty. I don't care. And can I just tell you, the Kuwaitis don't care either. <laughs> there are churches in Kuwait that argue whether we should be wearing jewelry or not. Let me just tell you, God does not care about that. Let me tell you this. When I was eating lunch yesterday at one of these restaurants in a room full of Kuwaitis with their cute little white hats on or whatever you call them, they don't care either whether we wear jewelry or not. They don't care. And the devil's inserted this little idea to divide churches so that we get our eyes off the mission and start arguing about how long is your, are your earrings. There are churches even in this room who are arguing on whether we should speak in tongues or not. Can I tell you something? God the Father in heaven does not care. Uh-oh, you're going to throw me out as a heretic now, aren't you? Well, let me say this. The people that I had lunch with yesterday, the Kuwaitis with their white outfits, well, the women had black. <laughs> Couldn't see their faces, but I assume they're women. <laughs> Can I tell you, the people in that restaurant yesterday don't care whether we speak in tongues or not. The devil has inserted an issue to keep us talking about tongues instead of winning Kuwait for Jesus. We're getting our eyes off the mission and we're arguing over stuff that is preventing us from the mission. There are people in this room who argue over whether we should sprinkle or dunk.
we take trips to the Holy Land and we always take our teams to the Jordan River and we do the baptism there. And it was so cute. We were there last time and there was an Orthodox church from Greece who showed up and they literally got into the river stood there with their white gowns on, dry from the waist up because the bottom waist down, they were in the water. And what did they do? The priest came over, took some water in the Jordan River and sprinkled their heads. I'm thinking, my goodness, you drove hundreds of kilometers to be here. You've got all the way in the water and you just can't bring yourself to just go down a little bit further and go down under the water. But... The devil would love for us to bicker over whether we sprinkle or dunk. Can I tell you the Kuwaitis that were in the restaurant yesterday don't care whether we dunk or we sprinkle. What they care about is their eternity after they die. And we've lost sight of the mission because we're trying to, our goal has become doctrinal accuracy instead of the lost. They tell me that there are 3.5 million residents in Kuwait. They tell me that 82% are Muslim, 14% are Christian, another 3% I think are Hindu. But of the 14% who are Christian, they tell me that, that there are, so there's about 420,000 believers in Kuwait. They tell me that of the 420,000 believers in Kuwait, 34,000 are revivalists and Pentecostals. 46,000 are evangelicals. The rest are Catholics and Orthodox. And in those subcategories, we got some differences, but I wanna just remind you, we're just broken pieces of glass and we should all be aiming for the same purpose and we should not be disputing on, on, on those matters. If revivalists could just find a way to appreciate the Pentecostals, and if the evangelicals could just find a way to appreciate the charismatics, and if all of that group could just appreciate the mainline and traditional denominations, then we could become a powerful force. 420,000 believers. That's, wow, out of... Three and a half million, that's, what is that, one-seventh of the population? One out of every seven? That's powerful. But the devil knows that power, and so the devil is inserting these schisms. The devil's inserting these schisms so that the other three million never hear it and Jesus knew the power of the unity of 420,000 guests that's come to Kuwaiti and brought their faith with them that Jesus knew that such power he prayed for that power we can make a difference in this country if we will lay the differences aside and aim at the goal. I'll close with this. Jesus is still praying, may they experience such perfect unity May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know you sent me. Let's contextualize that. May the churches in Kuwait experience such perfect unity that 3.5, 3 million Kuwaitis will know 
that God the Father sent Jesus the Son to earth to redeem the world. Remember, Jesus was praying for us in the room. We already acknowledged that. Jesus was praying for what I just said. So how will three million Kuwaitis know that Jesus was sent by God to earth and he wasn't just a prophet, but he was actually the son of God? How will 3.5 million Kuwaitis know that? The perfect unity of the people in this room. Is that what you're reading in yellow? Do you see it? Well, let's look at the inverse because the inverse is also true. What is the number one factor to prevent three million Kuwaitis from ever realizing the truth that Jesus was sent by the Father to the earth to save us. What is the number one factor that will prevent them from knowing that? It's not, it's not Islam. Islam is not what's preventing them. What, according to this verse, what is preventing three million Kuwaitis from understanding and knowing that Jesus was sent by the Father to save them? What's the number one preventive measure? Divisiveness amongst his kids. Sibling rivalries over petty stuff. You heard I had 10 children. So we had to buy a 15 passenger van. <laughs> and mom and I would take vacations together. We would drive places. And we wouldn't even be out of our neighborhood yet. And my seven-year-old was sitting next to my five-year-old and they would go, Mom! Nicholas crossed the line! An imaginary line in the seat and Nicholas crossed over it. And they're ruining the dynamics of our vacation over imaginary line. And mom and I are in the front seat going, look at each other going, I can't believe this. Can I just tell you, right now, we have people, siblings saying, Dad, they're not speaking in tongues. <laughs> and the father's looking over at the son going, they're going to ruin the dynamics over that? Come on, please. Just a thought. My name is Mark Morrow, and I'm your friend. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you love them as much. How much does the father love the son? How much? Can anybody say an infinite capacity? An infinite capacity. How much does the father love the lost? Can we say an infinite capacity? How will three million Kuwaitis ever know how much the infinite capacity of the love of the Father is to them? How will they know? Will it be our doctrinal correctness? Will it be our, our most relevant music? 
Will it be the way we dress on Sundays, whether we wear a hat or not, if we're a woman? How will three million Kuwaitis know the infinite capacity of the love of the Father toward them? How will they know? Anybody hazard a guess? By our perfect unity. May they experience such perfect unity that three million Kuwaitis will know how much you love them. But the inverse is also true. What is preventing three million Kuwaitis from knowing that the Father loves them infinitely? What's preventing them? It's not Islam. It's the fact that we got a bunch of siblings that can't get along, arguing over imaginary lines that don't exist. And I believe that this was such a major issue to Jesus that anything less than that is sin. If I'm doing something that is preventing somebody else from coming to know Jesus the way I know Jesus, I am committing sin. So I have one final verse. <coughs> if another believer is overcome by sin, let's contextualize this for this conversation. If another spiritual believer is overcome by factors that's contributing to disunity, are you with me? If another spiritual believer in this community is overcome by factors contributing to disunity in the body of Christ, then what are we supposed to do? Then you who are godly should humbly help that person back to the right path. Let me just say, you who are godly, you in this room are godly. I know you're not perfect, but you're godly. You want the best for the things of God. You're godly. There's various... Uh, Spectrums on that godliness scale, I understand that. But this is a room full of godly people. We are saved by grace. God is not remembering our sins. We are godly. And so if there are other, are you listening? Lean into this because we're closing with a punch. If there are other godly, if there are other spiritual leaders in this community who are contributing to disunity, then those who are godly, those who have been a part of this breakfast, those who have heard these truths, those who are serving Jesus the best they can, then it's our responsibility. And this is the countercultural teaching of Jesus here. It's our responsibility to make the initial, the, the, take the initiative. see, our natural instinct, remember our ways are opposite to God's ways. Our natural instinct is, no, they're the ones wrong. We're going to pray that the Holy Spirit will convict them so badly that they will repent of their sin and come back to us groveling. If you're waiting for a spiritual leader who's contributing to disunity to realize his error and to repent... It's going to be a snowy day in hell before that happens. <laughs> Let 
God didn't say, pray that the Holy Spirit will convict them and you just wait there in your piety for them to come groveling to you, admitting their error and humbly confessing and wanting to merge their church back into your church and you get all their tithes. That's not going to happen. No, Jesus said, no, you who are godly, you take the initiative. You go find a pastor who's contributing to disunity, who is in sin, who's preventing the Kuwaitis from coming to know Jesus by his very disunified actions. You go to them and humbly help that person get back on the right path. Isn't that what Jesus did for you? You were lost. You were in your sin. You couldn't find God if your life depended on it. But Jesus, as perfect as he was in the sanitized conditions of heaven, walking on streets of gold, left that perfect context. And he came down and he put on a pair of sandals and got his feet dirty with the Palestinian dust. And he walked among us and he reached out to you and to me humbly and gently and kindly and pointed out our error and loved us into the fold. And what Jesus has done for me is now my responsibility to carry it forward and to humbly go to those who are causing us to lose. What do you mean we're losing? The Kuwaiti birth rate is greater than the conversion rate. And so as each day passes, there are more Kuwaitis being born and going to hell than there were yesterday. We've got a mission. Let's stop arguing over what kind of songs we need to sing, what kind of doctrine needs to be correct. Let's embrace each other's differences. Let's look across the table and say, I give you permission to be different from me. Because you're a broken piece of glass and I'm a broken piece of glass. And right now we look ugly together, but God lives in heaven and somehow he finds beauty. Let's go out and let's link arms and let's keep our eyes on the goal. Let's get our ball in their net. Let's symphonize. You're a horn. I'm a drum. But together, oh, we can make an awesome noise. I just want to close with this question. Do you have pen in hand? I'm going to ask a question. We're going to close our eyes in quietness. The only thing we will hear is the wonderful air conditioner. Hallelujah. We're going to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Are you looking at me? I'm going to ask you a question. As a godly leader whose responsibility is to contribute toward unity, who do you need to call? Who do you need to call? Every one of us in this room knows some other spiritual leaders. Did you know that this breakfast was open to a lot more people? But when people found out the particular denomination I belong to, they said, oh, we don't want to go. So crazy. 
Every one of us in this room know people that are contributing to disunity because they've confused unity with sameness. Because you're not the same as them, they don't want to have anything to do with you. We all know people in this room. Who is it that you need to take the initiative and call and say, brother, sister, can we have a cup of tea together? Who do you need to call? Let's start building bridges right now. Because Kuwait needs Jesus. Would you bow your heads with me? Bow your heads. Pin in hand. Holy Spirit, this is where you come in. This is your role. Holy Spirit, would you begin to shine the spotlight on our need? Holy Spirit, would you shine the spotlight? Would you reveal to me who I need to call? May I start the process of a unified body so that we could win the lost. Reveal. As someone comes to your night to your mind, would you just write that person's name down? As the Holy Spirit shows you who you need to reach out to, to take the initiative, would you just write that person's name down? We all know somebody. We should all participate. This is the final exam of this class. I'll just wait a little bit longer because there's some people that haven't written down anything yet. I'm just waiting. Thank you for your courage. I honor you for what you're doing in your courage. And now I want you to make a personal commitment to say, I will take the initiative. I'm going to call this person or email them and ask them if we could have tea. And between now and that call, I'm going to be interceding for them that the Holy Spirit would prepare their heart for my call. See, that's the role of the Holy Spirit. We don't have to do what God does. God does his part. We do our part. God's already moving on that person's heart. Now God's just waiting on you to partner with him and make the call. It's together. He doesn't want to do it without you, and you can't do it without him. So don't think this is all about you. This is not about you. It's about you and God. And God, what God wants, he wants there to be reconciliation. And so I want you to commit right now. Holy Spirit, I know you're working on that other person's heart because you want us unified more than I want it. And so, Lord, I'm committing to you to do my part to reach out and to initiate as the godly person in this break. Initiate a T where we can build a bridge
where we can embrace our differences and embrace our common cause. Lord Jesus, I pray for my dear friends in this room. Thank you that they would take a Saturday morning and come and to open the scriptures and to explore how they could improve as a leader. And I pray that a revival will occur in Kuwait as a result of this meeting. May, may the principles here spread as we one by one share the concept. The goal is more important than our differences. Jesus, I commit this to you. We want to see Kuwait come to Jesus. Thank you.